Okay, it is 1235. So let's get started. Today, we are going to be talking about the overlapping generations model. Sometimes in the slides, I call it the diamond model. Um, so the plan today is to uh, do the Kahoot. We have a relatively short one today. Then we'll do Q&A about the OLG model. And then finally, I'll talk more about problem set one. We'll do one or two of the problems uh, that are left there, depending on how much time uh, we have. So without further ado, any questions? Today, 21 participants. Um, so, you know, in a normal course, I would say that what's typical is that, um, like in a physical course, when I usually teach this course, um, usually there's, you know, everybody comes to the first lecture and then it kind of decreases very quickly. And then about half the students are there for most of the lectures. And then there's kind of this spike at the end again. And I would say that so far it's pretty close to that um, is, it's uh, been repeated with the online lectures as well. All right, I guess these aren't lectures, these are just uh, question and answer sessions anyway. Okay, so let's do the Kahoot. Wow, a lot of J names. When I was a graduate student, I organized, I had, I was printing out papers, like academic papers, and I was trying to organize them in a desk by a letter of the alphabet. And you got this very interesting thing. So in, in economics papers, the order of the authors almost always is alphabetical. So I ended up having like a huge A file. And then like after M, there was like nothing because uh, there's always somebody who's, one co-author whose name comes before him. Eco no nomics. <laughs> I think we lost somebody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> Oof. We have 22 people listening. We only have 13 signed up. So the other nine people don't want to join. Okay, well, you just have to keep your own score then. Here we go. There's only six questions, but I, I was reviewing them there relatively hard. In the overlapping generations model, an increase in capital rental rate, so R, leads to higher savings rate, lower savings rate, indeterminate, or no change in savings rate. Okay, so um, the plurality of you said indeterminate, which is correct. Um, I can see why you might think there'd be a higher savings rate, right? If uh, we know in this model that 
people are all savers, right? There's only, um, <clears throat> you work when you're young and you consume only when, I mean, you work when you're young and then when you're old, you just live off of your capital, live off of your savings. So you might think that, well, if, if we're savers, when the interest rate goes up, then that should make saving more attractive. So um, then, you know, we should save more. But the thing is, there's two effects, right? There's the substitution effect. That's this. That's the motive I just described, which is I'm a saver. The interest rate went up. Now it's like more attractive to save. But on the other hand, um, there's also the income effect. I become richer as well. And if I become richer, I might actually want to sort of consume more in both periods. It could actually decrease my savings. And just to show you from the slides, mathematically, you can see that R here is the rental rate of capital. And when this goes up, um, it depends on theta uh, about which direction that changes the savings rate. Okay, And that has to do with, again, this uh, substitution versus income effect. Do the selfish young like it if all the old people suddenly die before production starts? Yes, no, or indeterminate. No music? Did I turn it down to mine? Okay, so um, there was a lot of dispute here. Okay, so I mean, I think that if this were an exam question, I'd have to be a little bit more specific. But, um, but the reason that I said yes is um, because the idea is that old people aren't working, they're just consuming. And if they die, their capital doesn't disappear. So the economy really could produce just as much if only the young people were working and all the old people died. Now you might say, what happens to the capital, right? So that's that's really the question. Um, but you know, again, if the old people die, it's not like their capital disappears. So then you know the capital goes to someone, buildings and machinery or whatever, you know, macroeconomic jelly. So um, that's, that was my kind of train of thought when I was uh, writing this question. I mean, I'm not sure what the no people were thinking, but you know, you might think, I don't, I don't know, maybe the old people before they die, they throw all their capital into the ocean despite all the young people or something like that. Um, you know, that could be as well. Um, and then I guess indeterminate's the same. Anybody want to uh, pipe in there? But an alternative, why you answered no or indeterminate? For me, I was just wondering, like, if old people are still working or they're really retirees, because like for a young person, maybe a 30 year old is already old. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I kind of meant through the lens of the model, right? Where there's like young people that work and, and uh, consume and then old people just consume. But um, <laughs> that's fair enough. If you want to use this in the more colloquial version of old, yeah, I'm, I'm already an old fart, so that's a good point. Anybody else? I mean, it is one of the assumptions that the old consume everything before they die and leave nothing left behind. So we could say that they would consume all their goods and then die and leave nothing for the young. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, that's possible, right? That's, that's possible. So, I mean, I, I tried to sort of head it off with this, the old die before production starts, but you're right that you could imagine it somewhere else. So, you know, kind of the way these periods work, right? Is that it's like the period begins, like, let's say, oops, I can't write on here. The period begins. So let's say this is T, make a line of what happens. Um, then there's production and then there's sort of 
consumption, and then capital is generated somehow out of savings. And then there's T plus one. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not really explicit in the book and I'm, I'm sure that you could, uh, you could make that argument, fair enough. But uh, yeah, cool. All right, so the next one's gonna be related. Do the selfish old like it if all the young die before production starts? Through the lens of our model, right? So. Yeah, no, so I mean, almost everybody now kind of agrees. Um, the reason why here is because production requires capital and labor and sort of by assumption in our model, the old don't have any labor. So if there's no young, there's no production. Any questions about that? Okay. Then you can think about this in terms of uh, Corona, if you like. All right, savings rate fixed. How does a decrease in N affect KT plus one? I hope I gave you guys enough time here. I think I, oh yeah, I did, okay. So how does a decrease in N affect KT plus one if the savings rate is fixed? So we're in law of utility. The interest rate doesn't change the savings rate. How does a decrease in N affect KT plus one? Yeah, good. It's a higher KT plus one, right? Isn't that weird? Uh, if the population growth slows down, then we actually get a higher level of little K. Sorry, there's some ambulances going by. So actually, the the you know there's there's an intuitive way to think about it, and there's a math way to think about it. Here, I'm actually going to show you the math way first. So here's the evolution of little K. Um, here we've assumed Cobb Douglas production, that's not important, but we have log utility so that the interest rate doesn't depend on the uh, level of KT. Um, okay, so, um, so you can see here that little KT plus one is equal to some function of little KT um, divided by one plus N. So if N goes down, then little KT plus one is going to get larger. Okay, so that's the math way to think about it. And then the other way to think about it is just, um, remember the definition of little k, it's big K divided by L times A, right? So um, if there's less L tomorrow, then there's not more capital, but there's more little k, capital per unit of human capital because there's less people. Okay, so you can actually imagine a situation where um, we have even well, I maybe I shouldn't, I think, let me, let me wait till the end because I think I might have a question about it. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's why the answer is higher little k. Okay. There's not a lot of questions here, but they're tough. How does an increase in little k affect the rental rate of capital? Yeah, it decreases the rental rate. I'll show you. <clears throat> All right, so our rental rate of capital, oh, oh, where is my thing? All right, so our rental rate of capital is equal to, why did I say t plus one there? Oh, whatever. I can't remember exactly the definition of um, how this works. So I guess it's little k t plus one here. Okay, so um, this is sort of like, 
the marginal productivity of capital. We derived that in a, a couple of, uh, it's the same as in the other models we were looking at and we derived it on some previous, for some previous models. Um, but the point is it's the slope of this thing. And, you know, we've drawn this several times, right? So, I mean, there's nothing different here in OLG versus the other models we've looked at in terms of the production function. So we've made an assumption on the production function that it looks like this. So that means that it's getting, uh, you know, there's decreasing returns to capital so that it's getting flatter over time. So that if little KT increases, then we're going to increase, or we're going to decrease, you know, we have a, a flatter part of this production function. So we're going to have a lower rental rate on capital. Any questions about that one? I think maybe you guys thought I was going to be asking you a trick question because all the other ones were all a bit tricky, but this one's more straightforward. All right, last question. Is the market allocation in OLG Pareto efficient? Oh, that's good. Indeterminate. That was actually, um, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was the answer I picked, of course. Um, yeah. So this is tricky, right? So it can be dynamically inefficient if there's too, uh, if there's too much saving, if the, if the interest rate or the rate of return is too low, then we have dynamic inefficiency. But if there's, um, if, you know, the equilibrium can be efficient in OLG, right? It can also not be efficient, but it can be efficient. Um, it just depends on whether the, um, in equilibrium, whether there's quote, more than the golden rule level of capital or less than the golden rule level of capital and both are possible. So if it's more then um, it is dynamically inefficient, but if there's less then it's not actually. Um, and so the reason why, if you actually looked in the book, um, I don't have it, it's hard to show you from the book, but they have something like, they kind of explain dynamic inefficiency and maybe one of you will ask about this uh, later, but they'll say, okay, so suppose we have time passing and we have some market allocation of, so let's suppose we have, uh, this is consumption. Uh, and this is like consumption at the golden rule. Uh, let me write that cleaner. Let's call this This is like say initial consumption and here's consumption golden rule you can hardly make it. Okay. So here there's too little consumption or in other words there's sort of too much saving. So what we can so suppose you know this is the initial path that the economy is on. We're at steady state in the OLG model. So we just are stuck at this level of consumption. All right, well, what we can do actually, these people here, they're saving too much, okay? They're not consuming enough, okay? There's too much capital. So if we, the social planner can sort of choose the amount of consumption or the amount of savings, we actually want them to consume less, okay? So, in order, so what we can do is we can have them sort of, I said consume less, we want them to consume more, we want them to save less. Okay, so what we can actually do is force these guys in this first period to consume more, even than they would consume at the golden uh, rule level of capital. I think it's like this in the book. And then after that, now we've sort of altered the capital stock so that we're actually at the golden rule level of capital stock. So we can actually sort of make this uh, change that's gonna just in increase consumption for every single generation a lot in the first generation to get them to save less and then just at the golden rule level of, of capital in, in future generations. Okay, now imagine a different economy, okay? Similar, but now let's say that they're consuming above the golden rule level of capital. So now golden rule is down here, okay? So here's where we are. Oh, wait, oh, this isn't. 
This can't be right. Okay, now I've, now I've confused myself. Uh, because the golden rule level of consumption has to be higher than the than any other equilibrium level of consumption. So I shouldn't have drawn it this way. Let's redraw it. Okay, so it's going to look the same as above, but the only difference is that the reason that this C is too low isn't because people are saving too much. Now it's because people are saving too little. So there's too little production. Okay, so you actually can't see a difference here. This, let's just say that this is K greater than K golden rule. And this is little K, should I give it a star? Yeah, less than little K golden rule. Okay, so these two pictures look the same. But the difference is that is behind the pictures. Here, the level of capital and equilibrium is less than the capital and the golden uh, rule level of capital. Here, the capital stock is greater than the golden rule level. Both are possible. OK, so now we're here. We want to get onto the golden rule level of capital. OK, but the only way we can do that is to force these guys to save more. OK, so the only way we can do it is to get them to decrease their consumption. Okay, so then we can do this. This is feasible for us to do as the social planner. We can force them to save more than they're saving, but that's going to hurt this generation. And, you know, that's it. Like, you know, we've, we've made them worse off. So this first generation is actually hurt by this plan. The rest of the generations, we help them, but the first generation we hurt. Okay, so we don't have this same ability to um, to sort of find some way to make every generation better off if the market capital stock is less than the capital stock at the golden rule level. Okay. So, um, so that's why the answer to this is actually indeterminate. It depends. If we're in this situation, then the social planner can do better than the market. If we're in this situation, then the social planner can't do better than the market in terms of making a Pareto efficient improvement over the market. We're going to hurt the first generation. You know, how do you see it here? These guys, they, they could have saved more, but they chose not to. So, I mean, we are hurting them by forcing them to save less. Any questions about that? I realize that's a bit complicated. That's, that's probably the most complicated part of the chapter. Yes, I have a question. Okay. About the first graph, um, the generation which is forced to save um, to save less in the first part. Yep. Does it uh, does it can does it then get a higher return because the interest rate increases, or because the young generation in the future will give uh, this generation which has saved more a part of their uh, income? Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, and I mean, at this point, it's kind of like we, the planners, are just forcing people. We're, we're just choosing savings for people. So, I mean, in a sense, um, you know, neither exactly. But you are right that um, the kind of the reason why there can be dynamic inefficiency in this model is because there's something that there's a, a way of saving that the planner has access to, which, um, which people in the economy don't, okay? So um, the planner can take money from the young and give it to the old, okay? And I think I had mentioned this in the last set of um, either slides or the last set of uh, cahoots, but you know, there's a, there's a return on, on that, right? Because when the planner takes the, the generation of young are bigger. So if you take one unit away from the young and give it to the old, you actually can for um, you can actually give each old person one plus n units because the younger generation is growing, right? So each younger generation is bigger. So if I take one from each young person and then divide it up evenly among the old people, I can actually give each old person one plus n. Okay. So um 
So that's actually a way of sort of saving that the, um, that the people in the economy, like the young themselves don't, I mean, they don't have access to that, right? Because the young in the next generation, they can't promise, the only people that are alive at one time is the young and the old in one generation. So if the young give money to the old, in the next period, the old are dead. So who's gonna pay back the young, right? The young can't make a contract with the young in the next generation. Only the social planner can do that. You see what I'm saying? So it's like only the planner is able to always in each generation take resources from the young and give it to the old, which is why sort of this sort of exchange is possible. It's sort of, we have an additional way of saving that the people in the economy don't have access to. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. That's so it good. is both for an increase in interest rate and for uh, this, uh, this action by the government. Well, I mean, if, uh, if you save less, then the interest rate is high or not? The interest rate is never going to be high, right? I mean, based on the last slides, we said that when there's a higher level, of, oh, so excuse me, you're right, the interest rate, yeah, the interest level is higher, you're right, because there's a lower level of capital. Um, but you know, in this thought experiment, the planner is choosing, right? The planner is like, we're not really letting people make decisions. The planner is choosing what, what uh, the savings levels are. You know, this here is the market allocation. The X's is the market allocation under the particular parameters of the model we found. So it's like, you know, if we allow the people to go back, they will go back to that market allocation. The planner here is choosing the savings rates. We're taking away the choice of the, of the um, individuals. But you're right that there, you. will be a, yeah, there will be a higher interest rate, but what we're doing here is, is we're the government we're choosing. Okay, we can talk about that more if you'd like um, during the question and answer session. Okay. All right, so uh, let's jump right in to the slides, which I have here. Okay, so you guys got any questions about the uh, OLG model that I can help with? Yeah, I think this point is sort of, you know, this OLG model, uh, it's, it's really used a lot to analyze pensions, right? Pay as you go. So in, in a sense, the scheme I was just describing to fix the dynamic inefficiency, it has the feeling of a pay as you go pension, right? We're taking from the young and giving to the old. And that kind of works because the population is growing, right? So you can kind of see that built into these models um, is the idea that it's easier to support a pension system when the population is growing. Okay, so, um, you know, that's, in, it's kind of in, these models in a nutshell are telling you why uh, people are worried about low population growth rates. Um, it's exactly this reason, you sort of lose the ability to do this sort of trick of taking one from each young person and giving one plus n to each old person. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I just made a question in the in the chat. Uh, if you could explain the graph on page uh, 19 again, please. Sure. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay, so you want to know about these arrows, how this works. So let's look at this expression. Okay, so here we have little kt plus one. It's a function of little kt. Okay, so you know this is some function, and actually, if you see, it's a, it's a just little kt to a power, and that power is less than one. So you know that's going to be some sort of concave function times a constant. Okay, so that's really what we have here. Okay, so so far so good. So then the question is, you know, what do these arrows mean and why are we doing this thing? Well, the idea is that if we start at little k zero, then our function from the last slide is going to tell us that at kt plus one, uh, k one, I should say. So if we start at k zero, at k one, we're gonna have this much capital, okay? And that's just taking little k zero I'm going to go back one side here. Take our whatever little level of little k t, uh, little k zero we have, plug it in here. You know, these are all parameters. We know what they are. Then we can figure out what is k one. Take k zero, plug it in. We get k one. Okay. All right. Now we want to know. Okay. Now it's the next period. It's k one. We want to know what k two is. Okay. So we've got k one here. We want to know what k two is. Well, we're gonna do something creative. We're gonna take K1 from this axis and we're going to put it onto this axis. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna use this 45 degree line. So, you know, that just says that this much up on this axis is the same as this much out on this axis, right? You know, it's the same. It's just making squares as we kind of go up this line, right? So, um, so all we're doing is we're just taking that K1 and flipping it from the y-axis onto the x-axis. All right, now we can look, what's K2 gonna be? Well, we're gonna use our formula from the last slide. That's gonna tell us that our level of K2 is right here. Use our trick, let's flip K2 onto this axis. What's K3 gonna be? Well, it's gonna be over here, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so why are we kind of doing this? Um, arrow thing, well, it's kind of just doing what we were just doing, right? So we're starting here, starting at k0, we get a k1, all right? Then using this reflection, here's our new k1. Okay, so that's going to be our k2, right? Using our reflection, here's k2. This is going to be our k3, and we're actually just going to kind of keep going down into this uh, in, until we get to k star eventually. And then of course, if we start down here, then you can see that we're gonna do the same operation, right? Suppose K0 over here. Well, here's K1. And then, then let's flip K1 down onto this axis. Here's K2, et cetera. We're gonna do, keep going until we get up here to K star from the bottom. Any other questions? Could you explain the growth at equilibrium again, the slide? I think it's 21. Sure. ATLT grows at rate N plus G plus NG. <clears throat> oh, yeah, you're saying why isn't it just N plus G? Um, so uh, in, in the last model we were looking at, it was continuous time. Um, this model is in discrete time. So, um, you know, if I think, uh, shoot, let's do it here. Okay, so what is, so how is AT plus one related to AT? Well, we've assumed that it's one plus G times AT, right? How is LT plus one related to LT? Well, it's one plus N times LT. Okay, so you can see that AT plus one, uh, oops, times LT plus one. Oops. 
is equal to one plus G times one plus N times AT times LT, okay, which is N plus G plus NG times AT plus uh, AT LT. A T L T. Okay. Yeah, so I see grows at rates. I should maybe that was not uh, super specific, but what I mean is just this uh, this expression. So let's see here. Is there anything else that I need to say? Oh, okay. I mean. Did you want me to say something more than just what's here? Like, how does the math work? No, no, no. Uh, that was all like the NG okay. part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. NG. It's it's a little bit different because we're in in discrete time rather than continuous time, and we're kind of defining the growth rate as this object, rather than the object we had from the last graph, which would uh, from the last set of slides, which where we had something like this, uh, a zero times e to the gt equals at, right? This is like the continuous time. That would be the growth rate in continuous time. Here for discrete time, we're defining the growth rate as this object. And then of course, since you have constant returns to scale, You know, if this is growing at a particular rate, um, if we want little k to be constant, then this has to grow at the same rate, which means that output is growing at the same rate, right? So, yeah. Okay. Do you think the assumption that uh, uh, interest rates are known in the next period is like a strong suit of the model or like a weakness? So, I mean, another way to say it is what would change in the model if we added uncertainty in terms of the interest rates? Um, I mean, it's really hard to think about any uncertainty here because this is a perfect foresight model. So, I mean, the people in the model, they not only can they forecast the interest rates, they forecast the whole path of capital um, forever. So suppose there was some aggregate uncertainty, there was a productivity shock in the next period and that would change and then you couldn't predict that. We would expect people probably to save a little bit more in terms of precautionary savings. Would it have any important effects? I mean, you'd, you'd have sort of unlucky and lucky generations. Um, so you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have sort of a steady state where capital is just constant forever. Would it create a business cycle? Mm. I don't think it would unless you, I think you'd need to have some sort of persistence among the shocks. Um, yeah, so I mean, in a, do I think it's important? I think whether it's important or not depends on the question you want to ask, okay? So um, this model is asking about, you know, the sort of growth of capital stocks, uh, capital per worker and how that's going to affect sort of long run uh, productivity growth, uh, excuse me, long run output growth. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the conclusion is the same as the one we had before, even though each generation is sort of independent of every other generation, you know, they only care about themselves. Even though we get that, um, we still have the same results as we had previously, which is that um, capital 
will only take you, uh, that it'll only make you grow up to a certain level. And then it's going to be technological growth and population growth that's going to further increase output. So that I don't think is going to change if we had uncertainty. If we did have uncertainty, I think that, I mean, I think if we were asking things about like the business cycle, so like that would be like fluctuations around the, um, around the say long run equilibrium, then I think that would be, then, then you need to have uncertainty. Um, and in fact, we will, when we, when we move from the growth part of the course to the business cycle part of the course, it's all going to be about uncertainty, about shocks to the economy. So that's a long answer. I guess to sum up, I would say for the questions that we're asking in the growth models, I don't think it's critical to have uncertainty in terms of the interest rate. But if we were asking different questions, I think that it would be more important. Um, do you know if there's a version of the OLG model that also portrays what like real life would be like? So with a childhood where you're also not productive or in other ways, not like only two periods, maybe oh, like yeah. a continuous version? I'm not sure if there's a continuous version, but it's typical. So uh, it's typical in these models to add additional periods. I mean, you know, if you add additional periods, but don't change anything, suppose in this model we were to make it, and even I even think that might be a homework problem. If we were to make it like, you know, two periods, three periods that people work, or, you know, 10 periods that people work, and then they're retired for three periods, um, it's not really going to change any of the of the important things in the model. It's just that people are going to sort of save up gradually while they're working. And then when they're retired, they're going to draw down on their savings. Um, so, you know, we could do that. It just adds additional notation to the model without giving any additional theoretical insight. But um, suppose that we were trying to study something else. Like suppose we were trying to study um, student loan debt um, or something like that. Well, then we would want definitely want to have people make a decision about going to school, right? We want to have some sort of education. Um, so then we want to have at least three periods. So you could have one period where you're being educated or not. You know, one period you choose to work or be educated, the next period you work, and then the next period you retire, right? You need to have at least three periods. So that's popular. Um, I think also when people try to like calibrate this stuff to data, you know, here it's just theory, but suppose that I was actually interested in, in really figuring out what's the production, you know, parameters of the production function and, um, and things like that. Then they do make models where you have, you know, suppose your data is annual. Well, then maybe we're going to make people have uh, sort of decisions every single year. And then maybe we'll try to uh, match our model to uh, the information about capital holdings by age level or something like that. Um, I think those are called life cycle models and uh, they're certainly they're certainly out there. So yeah. Here, I don't think it's important. I mean, you could add extra periods that wouldn't, it wouldn't get you any more theoretical insights. You can kind of think of these three models we've looked at as all being sort of the same question. They're thinking about how does accumulation of capital uh, affect long run growth rates. And they find that they don't, it, it, it doesn't, right? In the medium run policy that, that leads to higher savings rates can increase growth rates, but in the long run, it can't. Um, and I think the reason that it's important is partly historical because I, I think that for a long time, people thought that this was the engine of growth was capital, increasing capital stocks. In fact, if you go back to the enlightenment um, in economics, we like to talk, I learned, I learned this recently, so I'm going to tell you, but um, you know, there's this thing in economics that's bad called rent seeking. Rent seeking is bad, right? It's when you use resource for use resources for something unproductive. So like, market power or like monopolies, you know, that's bad. These guys are rent seekers. Um, and uh, I learned recently why that, where that term comes from. It's because um, back when the original sort of 
classical economists like Ricardo and Adam Smith and uh, you know John Stuart Mill, when these guys were writing, um, they viewed sort of two parts of society as really good and one part of society as really bad. Okay, so they thought of workers as good. Okay, they thought of owners of capital as good. Capitalists were good for these guys. Um, and the reason why, and then who is bad? Who are the villains? The villains were the landed aristocracy. So, you know, the enlightenment was when sort of these uh, merchants and these like sort of, you know, uh, capitalists, I can call them capitalists, when they sort of gained a lot of social power relative to this traditional aristocracy in Europe. Okay, so um, what did the capitalists do? Well, you know, they got profits, they got rich, but then they also sort of reinvested the profits into more capital, which makes the economy more productive. Okay, so for these original classical economists, that's great. These guys are really helping. They're, you know, helping grow the economy. Um, whereas the landed aristocracy, they just owned land. Okay, so they didn't, you know, they didn't create any capital. They just sat on their land and uh, got rent, okay? So these were the villains, right? They're sitting on their land and getting rent from the land. Whereas, uh, whereas you know, the heroic capitalists are growing the economy and the workers are, you know, getting richer and all this stuff. So um, I think that it actually comes, so first of all, rent seeking comes out of that. And I think that this idea that capital is the engine of growth comes out of, of that classical economics. Okay, and in a way, you could you could look at these models and say that, in a sense, they they're giving us a negative result, at least in the long run, saying that because of decreasing returns to scale, we can't you know capital can't be the engine of growth in the long run. And next time we're going to turn and look at uh, the endogenous growth model where there's technological growth that the model tries to explain. Any other questions before I give you a break? Um, a short question on the side video that you made on, um, was that like the Parisian uh, liberal? Yes. Um, really cool. So <laughs> uh, I thought that the, it was kind of a circular reasoning to me because like oh. if, if you have, because at least how I understood it is, if you have preferences that depend on other people, then you can't have Pareto efficiency that cares only about your individual person. But that seems rather straightforward that like, if your preferences depend on what other people do, then of course, what is optimal to everybody will also depend on what everybody does compared to each other, because that's how it like ingrains itself into the uh, utility functions of each person. Um, but I think it's an interesting result uh, compared to what we usually get uh, from econo uh, economics, but it's more of an idea of um, the utility functions that would be there don't really, uh, how can I say that? It only complicates the idea of how Pareto efficiency is defined, but we can still use it as a measure of good or is you gotta that be careful. Like... You gotta be careful. Okay, so so I think that the way you want to think about the utility function, especially when you talk about that kind of micro theory, mm -hmm. you know, a utility function isn't necessarily a measure of what is good. A utility function is just a representation of someone's preferences, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, you give me any preferences up to uh, a couple of logical consistency things. So I mean. Uh, there, there are some small, uh, you, you can't be quite any preferences, but almost any preferences that people have. Um, I can give you a utility function, an expected utility function that will represent those preferences. So it's just like saying, I like apples more than oranges. Um, you know, there's no, you don't need to have any sort of normative view on a utility function. All you have to, you know, utility function just represents preferences. Yes. So, yeah, but I mean, 
to the other point about the Peretti and Liberal, if you guys haven't watched it, I'm sure that some or maybe most of you didn't watch the other uh, video. The impossibility of a Peretti and Liberal is um, this classical example about some tension between two things that we think are desirable in uh, society. One is that people should be able to decide for themselves uh, what, it, what happens to them in some realms. So for instance, you, know, you should be able to decide uh, what, uh, you know, what clothes you wear or you know, what books you read or you know, things that don't affect anybody else, they only affect you. You should be the one to decide them, okay? But on the other hand, we also think that um, if we can do something that everyone prefers, then we should do it, right? If everybody in our society thinks that doing A is better than doing B, well, then of course we should do A, right? But it turns out that these two seemingly both desirable things conflict with each other. You can't actually have somebody, you can't have both where we allow people to decide for themselves. And also when everybody thinks we should do something, we should do it. Um, and there's this counter example that, um, that was given by Amartya Sen uh, called the impossibility of a Predian liberal, but it's a bit involved to talk about it. So I'm not sure if I actually um, answered your question. It seemed like you were saying that it, it just doesn't, it just seems like it's not that much of a puzzle. Oh, no. So um, the, the thing I was going to, or I was wondering about is um, if you say that a Peretian liberal is impossible, is it not possible to just drop the liberal part and say, okay, we're seeking a yeah. measure um, for like Pareto uh, efficiency. And then sure. we have to take into account all of those things. So it's, it's more of a, I saw it more as a critique of like just being very liberal um, because if people have preferences depend on other people, if you want to make as many people as happy as possible, like a typical consequentialist um, thought that we have in economics, then we should also not be very liberal because we have to take into account that our, our preferences depend on other people. But wait a second. Like so, a so you're saying that there's, that, that, it, that there's some things that we shouldn't allow people to decide for themselves, like, you know, yeah. what book somebody reads. That person shouldn't be able to decide for themselves. We should, so, we should decide for them. I mean, like, if we have a society in which everybody is insanely religious, for example, and like everybody derives a lot of disutility by other people being sinners, then we should, in some ways, forbid those people from doing those things, even though it doesn't strictly affect us materially, because it still has like an influence on our well-being, like mentally. What if, what if just those people being alive is is uh, offensive to the other people yeah but then it goes into much more of a like it's impossible to differentiate between like or like have objective preferences but um i guess what i what i thought was just that it seemed weird to me that Pareto efficiency and liberal liberal thought had to be like bundled together as a singular thing See. No, they don't, I, no, they don't have to, right? So, I mean, I think that the reason it seems surprising is because it's two values that many people hold mm. um, as desirable. Okay. Know, freedom and, uh, you know, efficiency. But anyway, let me, um, uh, maybe you and I can talk about it later, Kai. But um, yeah, let, me, uh, give, uh, everybody a, let me give everybody a break and then we'll get back and uh, talk about problem set one. So 10 minutes. Oops.
Hi, if you're still there. Are you still there? I'm still here. So um, I'm sure you're familiar with like trolley car problems. Yeah. So do you know the one, this is my favorite version, is the one where there's the five injured people and each of them needs an organ. And then- well, from the healthy person? Yeah, so do you, do you kill the healthy person and give the five people the organ? Hmm. So obviously that's not Pareto efficiency, but you know, I think one objection to that is this idea of, you know, people should have some sort of rights or there should be some sort mm. of, you know, fundamental freedoms that people have. Um, so you know, it relates a little bit maybe to that. It's, yeah, like, well, it's, it's a little different, I guess, because it's not about Pareto efficiency there. It's about utilitarianism. Yeah, but generally I think that economics always have like, it always has implicit political values because no matter what you assume, like in terms of like the production function or like the utility functions or um, the way that your model works, it always has implicit assumptions that is favored in one way or another to some part of society. I don't really think you can have like fully objective uh, models in that sense. Um, for example, all of the models that we work with here um, generally ignore inequality between individuals, which given that it's an, an it's an aspect that's left out of the models also mean that theoretically anything could happen within that. And I think that's like kind of problematic in a sense um, because the absence of it doesn't mean that it doesn't bias towards uh, like any specific direction. Yeah, I mean, um, I, don't, but, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think that if I were to try to defend it, I would say, you know, inequality is an important problem, but, you know, let's write a model to understand inequality right now we're talking about the size of the economy yeah that's true so and um, you know, of course there are a lot of models written about inequality yeah the problem just arises when people use uh, the same models for uh, multiple things i think at least a lot of the popular uh, news and economics that you see in like general media often have a very skewed view because they don't they use very cherry-picked models to describe things that like have a clear effect on other parts of society yeah, that's, um, I think that's fair. I think that a lot of sort of popular economics commentators, they really just take um, the ISLM model and they just kind of run with it. Uh, yeah. But obviously that's uh, kind of primitive. Yeah, so the idea was more that like the, the idea of Pareto efficiency and like it's very fundamental or like the simplest version, which is just that if everybody has a preference towards something else, um, then that something else would be better than the status quo as long as yeah. everybody is happy. I think like in principle that works pretty well as, uh, as a concept, it's more that deciding between different states of the world and like policies that should be implemented means that you have to make a lot of other assumptions. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not quite as convinced as you. So first of all, I agree that it is a relatively weak, if you like, constraint on um, behavior in the sense, I mean, mm. from one point of view, it doesn't, ever matter because you're never in a situation that you're deciding between uh, uh, something that everybody wants and something else that everybody wants less, you know? Yeah. Um, there's always winners and losers in political decisions, but, um, That's true. but, uh, but, you know, even I have like, a, you know, I just have this intuition that, that, that there might, there might be times when we still wouldn't want to do the thing that's Pareto efficient. So Pareto efficiency says mm -hmm. in, I think, and you just phrased it nicely, I think I would say it is, um, suppose that there's a situation that everyone prefers, mm -hmm. at least someone strictly prefers over another situation, you know, should we bring about that situation or something like that? Um, uh, you know, would there ever be times when that, when we could do something that Actually, some, you know, some people don't prefer and no one prefers. I don't know. Well, I think it's a, uh, it's kind of like the argument I encountered when I first had a course in game theory, um, which is like, you can always uh, extend the preferences to include whatever, you know, uh, additional piece of information that you want to have. So like, if you, if you have like a game theoretical payoff matrix, then a really call out method of dealing with any lack lack of information you can just say oh well the numbers already take care of that so you can always say that like in the in the purest 
essence, Pareto efficiency is a good idea. It's just impossible to determine because it has to account for like a lot of things that we don't really know. Um, because like, if you say, um, I think you had an example in the slides about like, if we could make the richest people even richer without harming anybody else, uh, should we do it? Because that would be Pareto efficiency under like a Pareto liberal idea. Um, but then like in reality, then probably a lot of other people would gain active disutility by by seeing rich people get richer, um, both because of like relative prices of the things that we consume um, and also just the, the idea of being so much poorer than like the richest people can also uh, yeah. make some so, I mean, worse off. Well, I think the thing you just said there is important. So, I mean, I think that often, you know, the narrow sort of economics model version of Pareto efficiency is that everyone gets more resources or at least one person gets more resources, no, nobody else gets less. Um, but that's kind of yeah. a hollow version of Pareto efficiency. I think kind of the strongman version of Pareto efficiency is more like what you said, which is, you know, everyone prefers a situation, right? So if uh, um, if making the richest people 10% richer um, is something that someone else in society doesn't want, then it's not really a Pareto improvement. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that wasn't something that everybody actually preferred. So, I mean, the strong man version, it's not, that's not the strong man version. Strong man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it also becomes less useful then. Um, so, yeah. It gets well, it away. becomes less useful, but I mean, you know, I'm wondering if there's any counter examples where something would be Pareto efficient in that strong sense, and yet we should not mm. do it. So, you know, you could imagine side constraints, like suppose we, suppose we're some sort of Rawlsians and, uh, mm. you know, in the veil behind the veil of ignorance, there was some very strong conditions that we put in place about, you know, whatever the right to life or liberty or freedom or something. And now, you know, mm -hmm. here we are in society. Now everybody has preferences and maybe it could be possible that everybody would prefer to break some of those, uh, you know, for the mm -hmm. social contract that was made uh, in the, in the original position. And yet, um, so maybe it would be good for us not to do what's Pareto efficient. I don't know, but I mean, I think it's, it's interesting to think yeah, about maybe. it. Maybe anybody's ever thought about that. All right, so let's get back to problem set one. <clears throat> and I think I should be able to do both the problems that are left today. So you'll recall, let's see if I, I think I have it up here on the... I just wrote, wrote them here so you'll be able to see them. Do I, have a, I wonder if I have a picture of them somewhere. Oh, I do, okay, good. Okay, so the two problems we have are solo 1.1 and solo 1.10, okay? Um, so the first one is about the basic properties of growth rates. Um, and these ones are pretty straightforward, I think. So let's use the fact that the growth rate of a variable equals the time derivative of its log to show A, the growth rate of a product of two variables equals the sum of their growth rates. That is, if Z is equal to X times T, then the growth rate, if you like, of Z is equal to the growth rate of X plus the growth rate of Y. Okay, let's do that. So, It's A, right? So we've got ZT is equal to, no, I already forgot, AT. Nope, sorry, it's XT times YT. Are you trying to show us something? Oh, you can't see it. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> I need to share my screen. No, you're supposed to just draw it in your head. I'm going to say what are the equations and you're supposed to just uh, write them down yourself. Um, so sorry about that, but, um, I didn't actually, so all I did so far was I just looked at this problem. Okay. So the growth rate of the product of two variables is equal to the sum that is Z equals X T Y T. Then the growth rate of Z is equal to the growth rate of X plus the growth rate of Y. Okay. So let's do that. X T Y T. All right, and it said in the problem to use 
the fact that the growth rate is equal to the derivative of the log. Okay, so we're going to use that actually here. So here's the growth growth rate is equal to derivative of the log of zt with respect to t. Okay. Here I'm going to replace zt with x t y t. So we're going to get d log x t y t t t. Maybe I should start going down here. Yeah, whatever. Okay. So using a property of the of the log function, log of x t y t is equal to log of x t plus log of y t. So here we're going to get d log x t plus log y t dt. And of course, this is all within parentheses. All right, the derivative is linear, so it means we can split it. Okay, so this is actually the same as d log x t dt plus d log y t dt, which is x dot t divided by x t plus y dot t divided by y t, right? So almost all of the problem, like the three sub problems here are all, they'll have this flavor. Okay. So that's it, right? Here's the growth rate of z. It's equal to the growth rate of x plus the growth rate of y, and it comes from the properties of log. Okay. Next one, growth rate of the ratio is equal to the difference, all right? So ct is equal to xt divided by yt, otherwise the same. So let's just do the same thing. z dot t divided by zt equal to d log zt divided by dt, it's all the same. Now here's the difference. This is d log xt divided by yt dt. All right, and um, I always think it's actually easiest to um, rewrite this slightly. Let's call this d xt times yt to the negative one. It's just the same thing, dt. All right, we're gonna use our same trick. It's exactly the same trick as up here. So I might even just um, move to this step. The log of a product is just adding the, the two. Uh, log of a product is just the log of the first term in the product plus the log of the second term. By the way, and, and I feel like I'm missing a terminology there. But anyway, um, so let's just split this up the way we did above log of xt dt plus. Here's going to be slightly different, right? d log of yt to the power negative 1 dt. OK, so we're going to use one more property of log, which is the log allows us to take the powers down um, and put them in front of the log. OK, so the um, log of yt to the power negative 1 is the same as negative log of yt. All right, so let's just do that here. So we're going to get d log of xt t minus now d log of y t t and then you just get x dot t divided by x t minus y dot t divided by y t okay so that's part b it's all just properties of a log really all right c if z is a times xt to the power alpha, then the growth rate is alpha times, the growth rate of z is the growth rate of x times alpha, okay? a times xt to the power alpha. Okay. 
same as above, growth rate of C equal to derivative of log of Z2. David, are you uploading this afterwards? Sure, you want me to? Or, huh? Sure, I can. Yeah, nice. Um, okay, so uh, I just gotta remember to save it. In the past, I've done this and then forgot to save it, but I'll, I'll remember to save it. Even before we get off this call, I'll remind me to save it if I haven't. Maybe I'll save it right now. Okay. Oh boy. All right, so let's do this. D log of A X T to the power alpha D T. Okay, is equal to, let's use some properties of the log. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, this is a product, right? We have a product of A times X T to the power alpha. So let's split that up as we've been doing. So that's going to be d log a dt plus, and I'm going to take this power down here too. Okay, so it's going to be, tell me if I'm skipping too many steps here, d alpha log xt dt. Okay, now this is, a is just a constant, okay, it doesn't depend on t. So actually the derivative of the log of A with respect to T is just zero. Okay. So all we're left over with is this thing here. So uh, that's gonna give us, and then alpha, that's just a constant. Okay, so we can actually just pull that out front. We can get alpha times D log. Oh, can't that undo. It's weird. D log xt dt, which is equal to alpha times x dot t divided by xt, okay, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so that's that. Now I'm debating about whether to do the next one because I know the next one's kind of long. Um, and if possible, there's a seminar I kind of want to attend at 2.15. Let me just quickly go look here. I, I, last night I went through and wrote down some answers. Let's see if I can do it in time. It's close. Well, I guess there's no rush. So you guys saw that, um, that I posted the next problem set. Uh, I'm not sure if I posted it yet. Or it will be posted soon. I sent it into the... Uh, to the exam people to post on um, on your exams. And um, I believe that uh, it'll be posted soon, but it's not actually due until the beginning of April. So we should actually have plenty of time in these uh, Wednesday sessions for me to go over the other problem. So if you don't mind. Um, it's actually due uh, the 17th according to the digital exam. Oh, is it really? Okay, well, in that case, oh, really? Oh, that's gonna be a problem, if that's true. Because I put stuff on there that you're not gonna get in time. I might have to uh, talk to the exam people if that's the case. Oh boy, did you guys get it already? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh boy, okay, so let's see here. Next week we're doing endogenous growth. There's, there's only one problem on there actually that's gonna be um, not possible to do. It's the one on RBC. Hmm. I mean, I think we're all for postponing. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm sure I can't postpone because the, the exams here, it's crazy. The bureaucracy involved is nuts. 
Um, I'm sure I can't postpone it, but I wonder if I can't scratch the RBC problem um, and put that on the next one. Um, okay, well, thanks for that. I will look into that and uh, get back to you about it. Uh, that was my mistake. I thought it was due in early April. I don't know why I thought that, um, but uh, okay. And while we're talking about it, uh, again, you did it like an individual attorney and not a group. Okay, it's a, it's not me that does it, but um, but they did that. I'll let them know. Um, I don't actually have any access to that system. I when you guys hand in the exams, then I get a then I get access to a portal where I can grade. But it's it's all very formalized here, so the, even the professor can't access the exam system. Um, but okay, um, okay, I'll let um I'll let the my contacts there know uh, about the individual, and then also I will try to figure out what to do then about at least the last problem, which is going to be about something you guys won't have won't have seen before the exam is due. Um, I might just tell you guys not to do it, and then put it on the next exam. Um, okay, cool. So uh, are there any questions about this problem I did or anything else that we talked about today that I can field here before I let you go? Save. So when will you go through the next part of the uh, last exercise? Probably next yeah. Wednesday. Okay. I don't, and that should be fine, right? Because we don't have anything else to talk about on the exercise class that day. If you looked at, so I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure that none of you saw that there is an answer key you can find on um, for this textbook. I actually didn't really like the answer that the answer key gave for the second problem there, 1.10. I mean, I don't think it's wrong, but I think it's way more complicated than it needs to be. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about that next week. Any other questions? Okay, cool. So then I'll see you next Wednesday. Wait, but before you go, uh, I think that the chapter you're gonna want to uh, read or the lecture you're going to want to watch is the one on endogenous growth. And I actually set aside two weeks for that. That's quite a long lecture. It usually takes me um, two lecture sessions to get through it. So, um, you know, feel free to pace yourself. We'll spend, we'll have two question and answer session, sessions about it. Um, so that's it. So how much of the two hour video should we watch? It's two hours, huh? That's a long one. I mean, you know, it's sort of a theoretical discussion, right? Because, um, okay, as you, so you want everyone to be on the same page. Uh, let's see. So that you're not, some people aren't asking questions about parts of the video that other people haven't watched. That makes sense. Let me quick check here. I mean, let's see, it is a, a good place to stop. Why don't we just say, I mean, it, it doesn't matter as long as everybody watches the same part of it. So let's just say watch the first hour just to have something to say. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. I'll send out a note about that as well as the, um, homework assignment. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And I will talk to you next Wednesday. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. Bye.